Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the 21st Annual Herbert Rubin and Justice Rose Luton Rubin International Law Symposium. We're so pleased to have everybody here and excited especially to have our distinguished panelists and speakers to discuss a topic that impacts women around the globe. My name is Amy Zajac and I am the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of International Law and Politics here at NYU Law. Our journal is a student-run publication devoted to commentary on contemporary issues in comparative and international law. We feature articles on international legal topics by leading scholars and practitioners, as well as notes and book annotations written by journal members. Beyond publication, we host our symposium every year um, at the law school, and it focuses on different issues in international law and uh, timely issues. Uh, the purpose of these symposia is to raise awareness and discussion of novel topics and hopefully to initiate dialogue that continues beyond the event itself. In the past, we have held symposia on the human rights of migrants, on the role of judges and arbitrators in international law, and on the intersection of international law and environmental protection in a melting Arctic. We are very excited for our symposium this year on Constitution and Customs, women's rights and access to justice in pluralistic legal societies. A lot of hard work and effort has gone into planning and executing this event. I would like to thank NYU Law Student Affairs, Development and Alumni Relations, as well as our sponsors, Sherman and Sterling, Freshfields, and Wild Gottschall. We, we greatly appreciate your support and commitment. I would also like to thank our journal's uh, symposium committee, Danielle Muniz, Nina Seth, Patty Schnell and Elizabeth Thorne, and especially our symposium chair, Hannah Miller, who has been the driving force behind this event and who has put in countless hours to make this a truly exceptional symposium. Finally, I would like to express my extreme gratitude to the Rubin family uh, for being instrumental in the execution of this event and for your generosity, support, and dedication. We greatly appreciated working with you these past several years and hope to continue doing so for many years to come. Without further ado, I wish to welcome Vice Dean for Development and Leadership Initiatives, Jeannie Forrest. Dean Forrest. I will be really brief because I'm a horse. That means I'm not a horse, but I just am horse. I'm really um, so tickled to see you all here. Last night at the law school, we have this law school that does amazing things. You know that, right? You do know that? You know it? Come on, let me know that you know it. Yes. Last night we had an event on celebrating uh, marriage equality at the law school. We had a very sad event um, memorializing the life um, of a young graduate who recently died, um, a young woman. And um, it just strikes me as, uh, I think is on your program. Kelly's, Kelly Crosby's uh, name is on your program. I had a reading group um, of a group of young women who are looking at women's issues in leadership and how women lead differently than men do. And it seems completely apropos that we start today with this symposium about women's issues. It seems like our lives are all about this now. There's stuff happening. And this is the place where things kick off. Um, and so I welcome you here on behalf of the law school and um, particularly welcome the Rubin family. Thank you to Hannah. Um, I understand that uh, in our conversation last night, we had a lot of, we read the book, Sheryl Sandbrook's book about Lean In, and I understand that, Hannah, you may not get enough of a shout out, so I'm going to just shout you out. Uh, she's the senior symposium editor. She went to Harvard and got her master's in uh, anthropology of religion, which you wouldn't necessarily think ties in so neatly. It ties in precisely, let me just tell you. Um, but really what she got her master's in, and she's getting her degree in now, is how to be a load-bearing wall. Um, and that's what she did for this conference. And so uh, could you just join me in thanking Hannah for putting this together? <laughs> Thank you. 
everybody reports that, uh, that she really was, in fact, the load-bearing wall. Over the years, uh, Herb and Rose have been also their own version of load-bearing walls for this conference, thought leaders in this, and uh, gathering, I think, family together uh, represents the ethos, I often say, of this law school. The speakers we've recruited here are leaders from all of their different respective fields, and I think that uh, you'll hear more about them as other people, um, fancier than I am, introduce them. But I think it's really impressive that we've gathered together such a group of women here. And it speaks to our community that we are having these kinds of conversations and that um, the people who put this together are in fact leaning in. I asked a, this group of young women last night, 1Ls who were studying law, what it means to them to lean in. And they said, it means that we're going to throw ourselves into it with our whole selves. And I think that that is the hallmark, that is the signature experience of this law school, is that we throw ourselves into problem solving, to information sharing, to making a difference with our whole selves. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of throwing yourselves into it with your whole selves, because you will, in fact, make a difference that way. So welcome on behalf of NYU Law. Hello, everyone. I'm Hannah Miller, the Senior Symposium Editor. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. But also, the symposium would not be possible without the help of development, alumni affairs, and the wonderful symposium team that I had working with me. So thank you all for being here today for the 21st annual Herbert Rubin and Justice Rose Luton Rubin International Law Symposium. Every year, the NYU Journal of International Law and Politics organizes a symposium that aims to address a pressing contemporary issue of relevance to the international law community. And we want to thank Herbert Rubin and Justice Rose Luton Rubin for their commitment to help make this possible. We began planning the symposium last April, choosing to address the ways in which countries across the world have incorporated religious, indigenous, tribal, or customary law into their legal systems. How nations have conceived of the role of minority groups when formulating or evolving their legal structures. The title of today's symposium is Constitution and Custom, Women's Rights in Pluralistic Legal Societies. As defined by the International Council on Human Rights, Plural legal orders arise when a specific dispute or subject matter is governed by multiple norms, laws, or forums that coexist within a particular jurisdiction or country. On the one hand, these pluralistic legal structures are able to incorporate a variety of customary practices, belief systems, or enforcement regimes. On the other, differing standards of evidence, what can or should be considered criminal conduct, the role of gender or social positioning can create conflict and debate within a society. Sometimes these norms challenge or are even in direct conflict with what many may consider to be fundamental human rights. Women are often among those most greatly affected by these decisions. What their rights are, how they can seek justice, what avenues of remedy are available to them vary greatly by country, by legal structure, by cultural norm. In many places across the world, and even within US borders, women are subject to the roles society has placed them in. Cultural heritage, religious conviction, and the law are the factors that create these roles. Today we seek to examine the ways in which pluralistic legal codes affect these norms, how they affect women's lives, and what happens when women seek justice within these varied systems. How does the incorporation of religious, indigenous, traditional, or tribal law into a state-sanctioned system create new avenues for women's rights? How does it take them away? In order to best explore this, we've decided to focus on three case studies, Nigeria, India, and Mexico. While I am in no way as qualified as our panelists to do so, I will briefly attempt to give an overview of the issues at play in each country and to offer insight into why we chose these case studies to focus on today. We selected Nigeria as our first panel, as the legal system incorporates strict religious law into a common law-based federal system. Over the past 40 years, 
Nigeria has become increasingly, increasingly regionally divided between systems of Sharia, customary, and constitutional law. Within this time, Sharia law in the north has expanded from a limited civil application among Muslim citizens in the late 1970s and 1980s to include a Sharia penal code in the late 1990s. The expansion into criminal law and punishment has increased the debate over how to cope with the diversity of views in a nation that has recently moved from military to civil leadership and is working to maintain an effective democracy that unites both the North and the South. This debate has also greatly affected women's rights. On a national level, Nigeria has made great strides in promoting women's rights and committing to the elimination of gender discrimination through a national gender policy. This commitment is incorporated into the 1999 Constitution of the Republic of Nigeria and has also been documented through their ratification of CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women in 1995, as well as the Protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa in 2005. However, the implementation of the Sharia Penal Code in 1999 has brought new challenges and increased scrutiny for the implementation of women's rights, which is often skewed along socioeconomic and gender lines. Those prosecuted under these laws are disproportionately the poor and women, both of which face severe challenges in seeking out avenues for justice, fighting for adequate representation, or affording the appeals process. One case that brought heightened international attention to the unequal treatment of women in the Sharia legal system was that of Amina Lawal Karami, sentenced to death by stoning for the charge of committing adultery in 2002. Adultery under Sharia law includes having sexual relations with another man, even, as the case was here, if the woman is divorced and the man is unmarried. Lawal's boyfriend was not prosecuted because investigators could not find four male witnesses to say that they saw him having sex with her, the burden of proof required by the Sharia. Hawa Ibrahim, one of our panelists today, acted as Lawal's lawyer during this case, and eventually she was exonerated, the details of which I will leave to our panelists to discuss. However, this case was unusual, as lawyers are often not part of the Sharia judicial process, and women often lack the support and financial resources to pursue representation or work towards an appeal. The debate about the institutionalization of Sharia in the northern part of the country and the efforts by some to extend it to the south has continued to push the issue of determining the proper role of religion within the Nigerian legal system to the forefront of political and cultural discussions. Today we are joined by Hawa Ibrahim, a Nigerian lawyer and human rights defender who has served as a visiting professor at Harvard Law and Harvard Divinity School, where I was fortunate enough to be her student. Ms. Ibrahim was awarded the European Parliament Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought in 2005 and in 2014, President Goodluck Jonathan of Nigeria appointed her a member of the fact-finding commission dealing with the 219 girls kidnapped by Boko Haram. Our second panelist is Muna Nadulo, a professor of law and director of the International Legal Studies Program at Cornell Law School, and director of Cornell University's Institute for African Development. He is an authority on African legal systems, constitution making, and international development and has acted as an advisor for several UN missions and commissions across Africa. Our second panel will turn to Mexico, home to one of the largest indigenous populations in the Americas. Historically, reforms to recognize indigenous rights in Mexico have been limited. However, in 1991, the Mexican Constitution was first amended to recognize the pluricultural nature of the republic. In 2001, the Constitution was again amended to recognize the collective rights of indigenous communities. These changes officially recognized the authority of indigenous leaders and granted the right to indigenous communities to internally implement norms and systems of governance that reflect their values and cultural heritage. Women have been central to reform movements throughout the country that have furthered this agenda and have also worked to address issues specific to women, such as sexual violence, and unequal treatment that are disproportionately felt by women in vulnerable indigenous communities. For instance, the reform movement in Quetzalan represented a moment when local women successfully implemented their call for the protection of indigenous women's rights 
into tangible policies and programs in collaboration with federal, state, and indigenous legal systems. Local organizations became instrumental to the movement, pushing forward reforms related to gender violence and access to justice. Furthermore, the indigenous court in Quetzalan, established by the state ju justice authorities in 2003, has become a beacon of progress as a local institution dedicated to strengthening indigenous justice. Women comprise part of the governing council, enabling the female voice to participate in the decision-making process. However, the experience in Quetzalan represents only one case in a system that varies from state to state and across indigenous communities. Even with some gains, women still face great cultural and institutional discrimination. In the words of our panelist, Rachel Cedar, given the weight of gender ideologies that justify the subordination of women to male decision-making and power differentials, it has been very difficult for indigenous women to gain access to state and community justice. A patriarchal <coughs> vision prevails both in the state legal system and in indigenous law. Today we have three panelists joining us to discuss these issues more in depth. Alejandra Anquita is a Mexican lawyer and activist She's the founder and executive director of ProDesk, the project of economic, cultural, and social rights based in Mexico City. In 2014, she was awarded the Martin Ennals Prize, granted to individuals who have demonstrated, demonstrated a deep commitment to human rights and face great personal risk. Our second panelist, Esmeralda Lopez, is an advocacy officer for the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. In addition, for the past six years, she has served as a Mexico country specialist with Amnesty International. Rachel Cedar is a, is a senior research professor at the Center for Research and Graduate Studies in Social Anthropology. She has published extensively on gender, indigenous law, legal anthropology, and human rights in Latin America. For our third and final panel, as well as our keynote address, we turn to India. There has always been a complex interplay between constitutional law, religious freedom, custom and women's rights, and access to justice in India, a nation that stands among the most culturally, religiously, and linguistically diverse in the world. For that reason, India provides a fascinating case study for considering how a secular legal system incorporates and balances cultural and religious norms with individual rights and access to justice. India has a constitutional commitment to secularism and to the equal treatment of women. In 1993, India ratified CEDAW, solidifying its commitment to women's advancement through the promotion of international human rights norms. However, India also has a constitutional obligation to protect group cultural rights. In order to achieve this balance between individual and group rights, India has adopted a prolific set of religious personal laws to govern internal family relations. Women's lives and relationships are thus often governed by religious norms. The Indian legislative bodies have attempted to balance women's rights under this pluralistic legal regime through the enactment of legislation such as the Special Marriage Act, which allows women to opt out of personal laws governing marriage. The Supreme Court has also played an active role in addressing women's rights and in deciding that the court has the authority to interpret and rule on personal laws. To speak about these issues in much greater depth and nuance, we are joined by Rangita de Silva de Alves and Gopika Solanki. Rangita is the Associate Dean for International Affairs at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and longtime women's rights activist. Prior to serving in, this, in her current capacity, she was the inaugural director of the Woodrow Wilson International Center's Global Women's Leadership Initiative, launched by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. She is a human rights scholar and practitioner who has worked to promote the advancement of women around the world. Gopika Solanki is an associate professor of political science at Carleton University in Canada. She has spent her career working with women's rights organizations, human rights networks, and social movements in India at the intersection of gender, violence, equality, development, and law. She has written at length on the adjudication of family issues under religious personal laws in India and how these laws affect gender equality and women's access to justice. Continuing our discussion in India, of India, we are honored to welcome Brenda Grover as our keynote speaker. Ms. Grover is a lawyer, researcher, human rights, and women's rights activist based in New Delhi, India. As a lawyer, she has appeared in landmark human rights cases 
and represented women and child survivors of domestic and sexual violence, victims and survivors of communal massacres, extrajudicial killings, and custodial torture, sexual minorities, trade unions, and political activists. She's contributed to the drafting of new laws in India, sits on numerous government committees, and is an active media commentator. She was also named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine in 2013. The issues race day are not just theoretical. They affect the daily lives of women, children, and men across the world. Yet I would also be remiss to not again point out that in the wake of our current news cycle, these contemplations are not just intellectual debate or an anthropological study to be examined from across the world. The incorporation of minority groups into the law, into the very fabric of society, in a real and systematic way is something that must be explored. How do we handle the challenges raised by, ver by varied norms living within one legal system? How can we protect women's and human rights and simultaneously make space for custom and religious practice? The answer requires value systems to be questioned, our worldview continuously expanded. Our panelists today will offer insight into three systems, as well as the challenges, successes, and failures of each. We thank them graciously for donating their time and expertise to this conversation, and look forward to what promises to be a fascinating afternoon. I will now turn it over to our first panel. Good afternoon. My name is Meg Satterthwaite. I am one of the faculty directors of the Center for Human <coughs> Rights and Global Justice and the faculty director of the Bernstein Institute for Human Rights. We're extremely pl pleased and proud to be part of this symposium today. And I want to thank again um, Hannah Miller for all the work she's done. And I know she's also had a staff working with her. So thank you very much for all the work you've put into this. <coughs> and again, to thank the Rubin family um, who you know, just been here from the beginning, and we're really incredibly grateful for your substantive input and um, guidance and vision throughout the years. So my job is really very much to get out of the way. Um, I will just, and I, I don't even hardly have to introduce the panelists because in a beautiful manner, Hannah has already done so. So I will s simply say one or two words, and then I will turn it over to the two panelists. Logistically, you'll notice that in the middle of your table, there are some note cards and some pens. And what we'd like to do is encourage you all as the speakers are talking, if questions come up, if you can just write them down on those note cards and then maybe create a small pile at, this, at the edge of your table, some of the um, symposium staff will come around and pick those up and then we'll use those for the question and answer period. Um, so we strongly encourage that so that we have some great questions after the two panelists have spoken. <coughs> So, as Hannah has already said, this panel will be examining women's rights and access to justice in Nigeria within that framework of the topic of um, justice in pluralistic legal societies. Um, as Hannah already explained, and as many of you, of course, know, Nigeria has a constitutional system of law in which common law, customary law, and Muslim or Sharia law coexist. <laughs> All three systems of law are administered through state-controlled and maintained courts and other legal institutions. The issue of women's rights is addressed by each of the systems in various ways, sometimes overlapping, sometimes separate. We're lucky to have two leading authorities on these issues today, and we're going to start with um, Professor Munandulo, who is a well-known expert in customary law, women's rights, and human rights more broadly. And then we'll hear from Professor Ibrahim, who's well known for her work within and concerning Sharia and Sharia law application in Nigeria. So since most of what I was gonna say has been obviated, I'll just, what I'd like to do is do 
give you two quotes from the work of our two panelists that I think are perhaps helpful in framing. So Professor Angulo has written, as I said, a lot about this issue of overlapping customary law, constitutional law, and women's rights. And he argues that customary law should not be mistaken for a set of norms that are frozen in time, but instead should be guided by the principle that, quote, customary law is living law and cannot therefore be static. It must be interpreted to take account of the lived experience of the people that it serves. And I think that's also a good segue to give you a quote from Professor Ibrahim, who comes to you both as a scholar and a practitioner, um, which is a perspective I particularly appreciate as a clinical professor. And she has said the following. She's written a lot about overcoming fear in the face of social pressure and threats. When defending an individual charged with a crime punishable by death, she has said, quote, I do feel uncomfortable and sometimes afraid, but I fight my fear. It's somebody's life, so let me also put my life on the line. I will now turn it over to the panelists and I will attempt to keep time without being obnoxious about it. Um, I, I apologize, but I, I will be closing this right at two because I forgot that I teach between one and three, so I'm missing the first hour of my class. So I'd like to turn it over to Professor Ndula. Thank you. Thank you very much for the um, uh, introduction. Uh, I would also like to join the others uh, in thanking um, uh, Hannah Miller for the, and her team for the excellent organization and also for uh, organizing this uh, uh, symposium. And also like to thank uh, the Rubin family for making this uh, possible. We are grateful to you uh, for doing this. Uh, we decided that uh, I go first, uh, you know, switch to the program because I'm going to talk more generally in terms of how the plural legal system arises in the context of Africa. And then my colleague, Hawa, will then be more specific in terms of examining uh, an actual uh, one country. Because this Africa is not a country, so it's 54 countries. So I think we, it's good to get a perspective in terms of how this comes about that we have so many legal uh, systems. <coughs> and I think I start by uh, explaining here that of course the condition we're talking about is where you, you know, in one country you have um, uh, you know, observance of more than one body of law, uh, which is the case in all African uh, uh, states. Uh, and then, uh, um, and of course this situation does uh, pose real challenges in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the African uh, state. Uh, and um, <coughs> now, the, in the colonial period, uh, customer law was uh, you know, administered by different courts. Uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 that is that you had common law courts, uh, customer law courts, and uh, these operated in different spheres. And basically, the jurisdiction was limited both in terms of the law, the substantive law that the courts used, but also in terms of the uh, litigants. Uh, so, and we saw that. Now, of course, uh, there was also an over, there were usually was overriding legislation, which uh, was called uh, repugnancy clauses, which basically empowered courts uh, any time they thought that uh, uh, a particular customer law rule was repugnant to morality, that they would strike it uh, down. Now, uh, then, the, the, the question, of course, that uh, uh, arises is uh, how did this uh, uh, come about? Now, the, in, in the British system, uh, once there is what we call reception date for every African country, and uh, that reception date is coincides with when British rule was established. And what happened then, they passed what is called English Law Extent of Application Act. 
and that was a, a total uh, introduction of the whole English law. Very simple act, usually just four articles. First is the title, second simply said, as of this day, so for example, if I'm dealing with Nigeria, I would ask, what's the reception date in Nigeria? And then I would know the entire British system, legislation, the cases, everything was applied to that territory. Uh, and that, of course, because the dates for establishing colonial rule varied, it also meant that you have actually different uh, English laws applying to various countries. And also don't forget another consequence of that was that uh, the colonies inherited old English law because after the reception date, the new law did not apply automatically. So a lot of the reforms that took place in the UK in the 30s, you know, the labor conditions and all that did not apply in the colonies because of this uh, uh, reception now uh, date uh, approach. So that is how, of course, uh, we end up with the, this duality uh, in that uh, English law was introduced wholesale uh, and it found, of course, indigenous law uh, in its place. And in some places like Nigeria, including Islamic law. Uh, and it's not just um, those two. In the context of countries like uh, the Southern African states, you also find that, for example, there was Hindu law as well uh, because of the presence of um, uh, Indians who had been brought to the uh, uh, continent. Now, so as I explained, in terms of the way the system functioned, the British recognized this uh, indigenous law, but with limits in terms of repugnancy, in terms of uh, that it shouldn't conflict with the uh, English legislation. Uh, so this was a, a constant control in terms of what uh, applied. Now, so, at independence, all, all African states maintained the duality. They didn't actually <coughs> get rid of that. And uh, what you had is, of course, the continuation of uh, the, uh, the system, the common law being there, and now, of course, the indigenous law. Uh, and the effort was more at integrating the courts, but in fact, it wasn't really a proper integration. Because what they did is simply move what used to be the so-called native courts to the bottom of the legal system, uh, and then uh, they continued to actually only administer uh, uh, African law. Uh, and in some cases, the British treated Islamic law the same as customary law in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the duality. Now, and I think it's also important to understand that uh, it's, some, it's misleading to talk of, um, uh, sometimes it's misleading to talk of a pure African customary law because in the colonial period, uh, African law was distorted. Uh, and I think I quote here, you know, you see that in paragraph seven, I try to refer to um, uh, uh, Roberts when he explains that, you know, uh, there was the encounter between Sharia law, common law, Casper law, and of course, that uh, changed things. But also, there was tremendous interference in terms of the, the, uh, the British administration, in terms of the court system. Uh, they actually introduced administrative review over decisions from uh, native courts. So in the end, what we talk about is that uh, the colonial period actually gave birth to what is called official uh, Casper law as opposed to really what the indigenous customer law was. And there are many who would argue that in fact, this official customer law, uh, because it was developed in the context of patriarchy, tended to favor men. And it's the one that really reinforced the subjugation of women, uh, that in itself, customer law wasn't really uh, uh, that way. Uh, and uh, what you begin to see is of course, this, uh, what we call, as I say, official uh, customer law. Now, of course, it has its origins in the context of uh, African traditions and all that, uh, but I think I try to uh, point out there, for example, a decision in uh, paragraph, I don't know whether you can see paragraph 10 there, where there is uh, the, yeah, okay. So you see the, the decision of the South African Constitutional Court, which reminds us of this uh, problem, that in fact, uh, although I quote here, 
uh, and this, the, the, the case says, you know, although a number of textbooks exist and there's a considerable body of precedent, courts today have to bear in mind the extent to which indigenous law in the pre-democratic period was influenced by political, administrative, and the judicial context in which it was applied. So this really, one, whoever is studying uh, sort of like uh, pluralism in Africa has to be conscious of this fact that what you see is distorted uh, customary uh, law. <laughs> and therefore the challenge is actually to, to figure out what is really uh, traditional and what's not uh, traditional. And of course, uh, this is complicated by the fact that uh, uh, customary law is not written and uh, therefore has uh, challenges in terms of ascertainment and how do you go about actually ascertaining this. And one of the problems in the process of trying to ascertain a customer law, again, because of the, the role the colonial assistance played, they tended to ask men as to what was the law. And of course, the interpretation of the men in terms of what law was, was not the, always the correct way. I mean, they tended to push um, aspects of law that uh, favored their own positions. Now, when we come to the question of, uh, um, yeah, customer law and women's rights, it's argued, and I think that it, you know, uh, it's true, in the sense that when you take the official customer law that you get now, that uh, many aspects of it can be said to um, discriminate against women, and that is in the, in the context of especially inheritance, uh, a proper ownership and traditional authority. And here I'm talking in terms of chiefs and how you become, um, uh, <coughs> and I think the, uh, the, the, one of the problems that of course, customer law tended to emphasize membership of community as a way you access, for example, uh, property. So in that sense, it wasn't discriminatory in the sense of membership. But of course, once we change the socioeconomic conditions, that is not you know, fair when you actually still depend on uh, uh, membership. So there is, of course, now a major debate on uh, the continued application of uh, uh, customer law. So if you look at uh, human rights activists, uh, they would argue that, um, uh, that you know, uh, customer law uh, you know, uh, discriminates against women and that uh, uh, we need to, uh, to reform uh, the uh, the system. Now, I think one of the major tensions uh, of uh, uh, customer law and uh, uh, women's rights uh, is this aspect of membership. That you know, it was it's a system of law that was based on the community and emphasized kinship rights, uh, membership of clans, especially in the area of uh, uh, property law. And of course, this means that once you change the socioeconomic structure, you must change uh, the, uh, the law because it wasn't meant for that kind of uh, a system of law. Now, uh, so constitutionally, what happened was that the, at independence, the, the British model of the constitution, we call it Lancaster model because all the models were actually drafted in Lancaster Hall. Uh, so you look at the Nigerian constitution, Kenyan constitution, at independence, Zambia, and it's the same. Uh, they all came out of this model. Uh, and the Bill of Rights, actually, in that section was borrowed from the European Convention. And this is because, of course, the British themselves don't have a written constitution. Uh, so, but they did bequeath to all the, uh, the, the colonies uh, uh, written constitutions. Now, the, the independence constitution had equality provisions, no discrimination. But what uh, the problem with it was that uh, it exempted uh, uh, customer law from the application of equality provisions. So that meant, of course, that uh, uh, the, and the term they use that it immunized customer law from scrutiny in terms of uh, <coughs> um, uh, customer, sorry, in terms of uh, uh, women's rights and equality. So of course, this was uh, problematic. It meant that, in fact, it perpetuated the application of uh, discriminatory laws. So if you look at the provision, it would go something like, you know, uh, uh, discrimination is abolished, except when you are dealing with customary uh, law. So, of course, then the fundamental question that arises is how do you approach uh, reform in this uh, context? And of course, I'll show that later on, uh, today we have a very different 
uh, situation in terms of constitutions uh, uh, in Africa. So I think that uh, uh, in, in a question of reform, uh, uh, you know, as I try to point out in, uh, look at, uh, I think I tried to do that in the paragraph uh, 16, where I'm trying to say that um, then, of course, the, the, some of the issues that we need to focus on the reform is, for example, relating to access to resources, access to land. Uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, there is also uh, the question of uh, 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 inheritance, like I, I try to, to point out. Uh, now, the constitutional position has actually dramatically changed in terms of what you had at the independence constitution. So we had a period of uh, post-independence when these constitutions were maintained, and many of them got worse because governments, in fact, became more uh, autocratic. They uh, became uh, um, undemocratic in most cases. But fast forward to the post-democratization period. So today, when you look at uh, uh, the new constitutions in Africa, Without exception, all of them get rid of the provisions that immunize uh, customer law from uh, uh, scrutiny. So I, I think I, re I refer you uh, in paragraph 18. So for example, if you look at the Ugandan constitution of 1985, uh, you look at the South African constitution of, of 1996, uh, the Kenyan constitution of 2010. So this is what's actually now uh, happening and uh, the uh, the position now is that, in fact, uh, customer law does not escape scrutiny in terms of human rights uh, uh, provisions. Okay, thanks. So, uh, so fast forwarding then in terms of where uh, we are now. So, what we see is that the new constitutions are very clear in terms of. Uh, the relationship between uh, 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 customer law and the, the, the constitution. Now, of course, the, this also reflects the African countries' commitment, as was mentioned by um, our chair, that uh, you know, African countries have, for example, joined CEDA, they've joined all the international covenants, and they've got their own African uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, treaties that deal with the uh, uh, women's rights, the protocol on uh, uh, you know, uh, women's rights in Africa, uh, all of them subscribe to equality. So, of course, this new approach in constitutional making is actually a reflection also of their international commitment and also their regional uh, commitments. Now, and I think the challenge in the process of reform is really uh, how do you capture the good out of uh, uh, customary law, uh, and then, of course, uh, I try to come up with a unified uh, system of law. And I like the warning that uh, Justice Global from uh, South Africa has given, and you know, if you look at uh, that page where it says uh, that when dealing with indigenous law, every attempt should be made to avoid the tendency of constructing indigenous law concepts in the light of common law concepts, or concepts foreign to indigenous law. Regal norms develop in different situations, under different cultures, and in response to different uh, conditions. Uh, and I think once you begin, once you equate African law all the time to, uh, to sort of the common law concepts, you run the risk of tremendous opposition by those that see the process as simply one of trying to westernize Africa. Uh, and of course, that's objectionable to a lot of people because they would like to retain what they consider to be good in the systems, and of course, while at the same time promoting uh, uh, the uh, promoting equality and, of course, empowering uh, uh, women. And I think another area in terms of reform that needs to be focused on is, of course, the, the question of traditional authority. Because don't forget that the changes that happened in substantive law in customary law also affected traditional authority. That too was distorted. Uh, this is in relation to the powers of the chiefs and all these issues. Those issues too do need to be uh, addressed. Now, since my time is uh, uh, running out, uh, <coughs> I just want to emphasize two points. One, that uh, change in terms of customer law 
uh, is something that was ongoing. In fact, one can argue that it was arrested by colonial law because colonial law deprived customer law of its way of uh, reform. And in fact, invented what we call official customer law. Uh, and in fact, official customer law became a problem because it ignored the lived experiences of people. Uh, and I think that the argument now is that in fact, what you do, what you see, uh, you know, the modern courts doing is looking at the living law. What is it? And we see this, for example, in the context of a very interesting case in, uh, in South Africa, Sulua, uh, which involved the traditional authority, where the court, the constitutional court ruled that no, the community was right to say that the tradition that only men could be chiefs was wrong because they had evolved out of that and that in fact that changed. So the courts have recognized those changes. And I would like to conclude by uh, referring you uh, to, to uh, the cases that have emerged. So I'll go to like 30, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the African courts are actually playing their role when you look at uh, decisions that are coming out of uh, 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 constitutional courts. And here, I would like to draw your attention, for example, to the uh, Rametele case in Botswana, where the court came out very strongly that gender discrimination would not be uh, tolerated. And of course, the overruled customs that uh, discriminated in the context of inheritance. The South African court has done the same. Uh, in the Bay case, uh, in where, where they actually also uh, invalidated any customer rules that discriminates between men and uh, women. And very recently in Nigeria, you had the Ukeje uh, case, uh, 2014, Ukeje versus Ukeje, very, very significant decision, which took on the question of discrimination, gender discrimination in law head on. And again, a very, very uh, impressive judgment and uh, very clear that in fact the courts are playing their role. But I think the courts have limitations uh, because of course courts wait for cases to come. So I think that we have, uh, we have to have an agenda where actually we are trying to influence also uh, the legislation so that in fact we have programs that try to address uh, the, uh, this problem from a, a perspective of reforming and uh, bring about uh, uh, new legislation that addresses gender inequality. And I would caution that as we do that, we first examine what those laws were created for and what has changed so that we work from within the community uh, and not be seen to simply transplant one system of law to another uh, place. Because I think that uh, what you achieve by that is actually uh, opposition, you know, from uh, especially people who have a very traditional perspective because they see this as an interference. Uh, and I think it's useful when you examine, for example, uh, explain to the communities that in the context of land, for example, that you cannot no longer, uh, you know, insist on uh, membership because membership no longer means uh, what it used to mean. In the, in the context where people lived in one community. Uh, and those are the issues I think that uh, one uh, should do, but I really think that uh, uh, the courts in Africa, if you look at the, uh, the constitutional courts, they really are doing a very good job in terms of actually addressing the issues of gender inequality. And the, the agenda that we have is of course to how do we promote this and how do we encourage this to go on. Uh, so that the real, the real issue is no longer in terms of laws. It's really a question of implementation that's uh, remaining. No one is really out there saying that discrimination should continue. And I think that you'll find it, no court does that, including the customer courts. I mean, I find it very interesting that today, if you go to the customer courts, you'll find that even there, the courts are very conscious of uh, uh, adjusting customer law in order to meet the needs of today's uh, world. So I think I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, let me join. <coughs>
the earlier introduction to thank um, the organizers of the 21st annual Herbert Rubin and Justice Rose Rubin International Law Symposium. Um, I want to specifically thank the organizers and the sponsors and the staffs and the students. I want to thank Elizabeth and Nathan and my dear Hannah, one of the best students in the class at uh, Harvard Divinity School on our course on Women, Justice, and Sharia. Uh, thank you, Meg, and thank you so much for coming. Can you send our love to Justice Rose Robin uh, and our deep um, thoughts, and she's in our thoughts and prayers as wherever she is, uh, she's right here with us in spirit. Um, I thought I should speak about just three issues, and I think we should have more Q&A, you know? I wanted more questions, so I'm a hands-on, and I want to make some few disclaimers before I start. Uh, English is my fifth language, so if you don't understand what I'm saying, just wave your hand and I'll repeat myself, okay? I am not an Islamic scholar. I am just a lawyer. And so I'm going to speak as a hands-on lawyer on the field, and to introduce this topic of, uh, of today, access to justice and the plural legal in, you know, society, especially in Nigeria, I want to just touch on one or two things and I'll end up with a real case, an example on how we have used our strategies to get into what we want to get in terms of issues of access to justice and how we use Islam to argue within Islam and to get justice within Sharia. So I'll just end up with that story, and uh, I think we should have a lot of Q&A when we can. N Nigeria is a beautiful country, and I always say if I have opportunity to come back to this world again, I want to come back as a Nigerian, really. And um, it has its own difficulties and challenges, and one of which is uh, the multiple legal system we do have. Professor Muna, uh, thank you again for you know, laying some foundation as to what was and what is and what will, is to come. Uh, what was has always been the multiple legal system that was in existence, the customary, which is distinct from the traditional that was in existence and the religious before the coming of the British with the common law. And then after that, uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, challenges of uh, constitution amendments, and we have about nine of them in Nigeria, and it's still ongoing. Um, so which direction, which law, uh, whose law, what law? Whose law, what law? And so this is where we find ourselves um, in 1999. Now Nigeria became independent from the British in, 1919, in 1960, uh, and we always had the common law sort of governing us since 1960. In 1999, after a long stretch of military rule, um, some politician came in and said campaign. One of the campaign is that if you elect us, we'll give you Sharia. And he was elected and he gave them Sharia. And so that is how we had the Sharia penal code introduced into the country in 1999. And I will end up with the case of Amin al-Lawal where we use the issue of Sharia uh, to argue Sharia. Uh, so we are diverse. Uh, we are diverse in multiple layers. The South is totally different from the North. And I would say at this point that I am my client and my client are me in a way. I became educated by accident. I became a lawyer by accident. I guess I went to teach at Harvard by accident. I was given in marriage at the age of 10 and this is a different discussion for another day. Uh, but this is part of my life story. So I was doing the cases of Sharia from inside out, it wasn't that I was, I was asked to go and do it. It's like, I, I'm the first thing, you know? So if I don't go and protect me, who will protect me after? So, so my passion for the work I have done, and I'm still doing with the Boko Haram right now. I just finished one year in the Middle East. I was working in Amman, and I was understanding the Daesh and the ISIS, and fortunate incident had just happened. Uh, so this is my next project. But my earlier project of working within the Islamic fundamentalist was what has uh, given me uh, the humility to be able to continue what I'm doing today. So we are diverse as a nation. Uh, we are diverse by our people, by our culture, by our religion. The South is mainly Christian, the North is mainly Muslims. 
the Boko Haram is in the north. And I come actually from the enclave of the Boko Haram. My mother is from Borno, which is the caliphate of the Boko Haram. And my dad is from Gombe, which is all in the northeastern state. And I've been opportune, like Hannah introduced, to work there last year uh, to see if we could rescue those uh, 219 girls uh, that were kidnapped by Boko Haram. So we are diverse, and religiously we are diverse. Uh, that we have at least four legal systems, at least four legal systems. We have the common law, we have the Sharia, we have the customary law which is codified, and we have the traditional laws, and it depends on which village you are, they apply their own traditional laws self differently. So, but they are not codified the traditional laws. Uh, so as we move along, please put down your question and I, I'm, I'm happy to take as many questions as possible after. Uh, I grew up in the north and I was born and raised actually there in my small village that has no any facilities whatsoever and I never miss anything because I never <coughs> had it. Um, but the powerful person in my family house was my grandmother. I grew up with my grandfather, the most powerful person was my grandmother. And we can talk about it in Q&A. So where did we lose it? Where did we lose it? And it's a lot of society, the women are really powerful at home. They are not on the table, but they can choose the table from their bedroom. So it's how do we harness some of these powers? And as we look at global issues of global security and freedom, what power do the women bring into this discuss? What powers the student and lawyers will be lawyers in this room will bring to this discuss. And I hope we can talk more a little bit maybe during break, uh, especially with students. Um, I wrote a book, and my book is Seven Strategy of Practicing Sharia. And I will just mention the seven strategies by passing, because I think my, the example I will use about the access to justice and pro legal system will, will be you know, in, engraved in this, in this law, in this uh, case. So I'll just mention it quickly. Number one is, Understand the dynamic at which you work. What dynamic do you have? Remember, Sharia was introduced in 1999 in Nigeria, the criminal Sharia. And only five punishments were introduced. Basically, five punishments. If you, if you commit adultery, they call it zina, you'll be stoned. If you drink alcohol, you'll be flogged publicly 100. If you commit hiraba, which is you, you, uh, you steal and you kill, you be crucified. So this are may, uh, of course you cannot change your religion, which is Ridda, and you also be stoned. So these are the few punishment and uh, offenses that were introduced uh, in, under the Sharia in 1999. And I'll come to how I came back into taking up the case uh, at some point if I have time. So understand the dynamic at which you work, but most importantly, beyond understanding the dynamic of the law, dynamic of the mullahs, dynamic of the society, you must learn to work within. So my example will tell you how we work within those dynamics. And the second strategy is pay attention to details. The third, Focus and remain focused. And I'll bring it back to the fact that some of these cases attract a lot of microphones and cameras. Most of our cases were not in public view whatsoever. A lot of the very touching cases we did, we have no means of transportation to get to our places. At times, we take some horses. When we cannot, we take camel. Uh, when we cannot, we take donkeys. So we had no TV, we have no electricity, nothing. But when they came, especially I'm speaking to lawyers, will be lawyers as students in this room. How do you stay focused? How are you focused and you stay focused? Our duty, we have a duty of diligence, a duty of care to our clients. And as we move along, I don't know what are the tenants here, but that duty we owe to clients, we cannot afford to juxtapose that we're trying to get attention to ourselves. So focus and stay focused. And the, another strategy I wanted to mention here, as law students, is the ability of you to know the law, especially for the students. And if you can eat the law, digest the law, breathe the law, and that makes you 
much more than any other of your peers. And when you can imbibe it, that makes you a better lawyer. When I started practicing in the Sharia court, I had no voice. I went to, to appear before the court, the judge in, uh, uh, in Tzapi, in Zampara State. And I stood and said, my Lord, my name is Hawa Ibrahim, with me is Mr. and Madam. And he was like, what? He's like, there are men in the court, you know, practically telling me to shut up and sit down. Nine years after, I'm sought for. I'm sought after. It's because we know it. So I want to encourage you, know the law and leave it. Breathe it if you can. The next strategy I want to mention is the ability to plan everything you do. And I do it even as a student and even as a lawyer. Have your plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, and exit strategy when you can. For some of you that know, I have a lot of fatwas on my head. I had six fatwas. But it's the ability to also have an exit strategy. So you only don't plan. I was a prosecutor for eight years before I became a defense counsel. And before then, I was a police officer. So how do you sort of combine everything that you have learned or you are learning and don't, don't hold back when you have opportunity to learn, especially those of you going to soup kitchens, any small thing you do, it will come back to you. I never knew until I started some of these cases that are difficult, that everything I have lived before have come back to me, and I, I can tap on them and be better. So for some of you that are students are younger here, I encourage you every single day means something, every single minute of the day, tap into it and use it and utilize it well. And it has served me better, and I'm, I'm telling you as a living example. And I encourage you to uh, consider that. So how do you plan? As a prosecutor, I plan for the defense. I was defending the cases, but first I plan as a prosecutor. Before I plan my case as a defense counsel, I will argue and, and you know, tidy up their cases for them. But it's, uh, the ability for us to combine all this together is important. And the next one I wanted to see, I guess the last one, if some of you are taking notes in the seventh strategy, as think globally and act locally. Go beyond what you are taught in the classroom. Go beyond that. Go beyond the normal thing that we see. Whenever you think you know, that is when you should tell yourself you need to know more. That is my philosophy. Whenever I think I know, that is when I really, really don't know, I want to know. The ability to become judgmental, remove from us the ability to be able to know more. So I should, we should encourage ourselves to try to know as much as possible as we can. Um, so let me end by giving you this example of Amina, and I hope uh, we can open it to Q&A. So in 2000, in 2002, Amina was, in 2001, Amina had a boyfriend, and she became pregnant, and she was charged to Sharia court in Bakuri a town in Katsana State. She, was, she had two count charge. The first charge is that she was pregnant and she had no husband. And the second one is that she, uh, she confesses to adultery, which actually the word is zina. So adultery and fornication are lumped together as zina. So that was the two charges against her and she was convicted to be stoned to death by the lower court. So we came in on appeal. Most of these cases I have taken are people that are that share four common denominators. They are voiceless, they are powerless, they are poor, and they cannot afford to hire a lawyer. Powerless, voiceless, poor. So I took some of, I took the cases of, I took the case of Amina and at this moment, uh, an appeal, we argued 15 cases on the first appeal, 15 issues, 15 issues of law, basically divided into issues of facts, issues of law, issues of procedure, and technicalities. We failed woefully on all the 15, uh, all the 15 uh, points we argued. We failed. So we went to the next appeal, which is actually the last appeal. And it was during those appeal sessions that I was accosted by a reporter called Umar Farouk. And he asked me only one question. 
is stoning to death in the Quran. To the best of my knowledge, no. No. I never read it. And so when I gave the answer, the answer was played and played and played on the radio, which is the main media in that part of the world. And the answer from the mullahs is that I was anti-Islam, I was anti-Sharia, and that means stone me to death too. I see that run away to hide, or I face it. So I called the reporter, and I told him I had what the mullahs said, and if it is possible to me, for me to go and visit with them. And he said, are you out of your mind? Are you really cuckoo? You don't want to do that. You had what they say. And I pleaded with him. And he said to me, I would introduce you, but I would not be responsible for you. The mullahs were more gracious, really. They decided to see me, but they wanted to see me in the mocks. Now, so for some of you that could see me from where you are sitting, I think I am properly dressed, but I'm not properly dressed to enter the mocks. So number one, sensitivity. So I was totally covered from my fingers to my toes with a socks in a hot weather, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I want to be sensitive. I went to the mocks. There were eight of them sitting at the end of the mocks. It's a massive mocks in Abuja. And I entered, I had made photocopies of the cases I was handling then, 47 cases. When I walked in, I saw a chair halfway into the hall. I didn't go near the chair, I walked in toward them. And walking toward them, I decided, close to them, I knelt down and I sat on the floor. And there was a total chorus. No, 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 stand up, go and sit on that chair, they said to me. Now, I am not allowed by the culture to look at them on the face. Professor Munda will tell you that. I cannot look at the men on the face in my culture. So I was looking on the floor. And I said, how can I, Hawa, your daughter, sit on a chair when you, my fathers, are sitting on a chair? Now, they were quiet for some time. And when they answered me, they, when they spoke, they said, are you Hawa Ibrahim? Are you the lawyer? I said, as you please, yes, I am. But you remember what brought me to the mocks was the radio interview I granted. I did not speak about the radio interview. I told them I'm a foolish lawyer. I told them I'm a silly lawyer. I said, I, I'm there trying to help the women and children, but I'm not sure I'm getting it right. And I came to them because I needed their wisdom. I came to them because I wanted them to give me some knowledge and empower me. This is my dynamic. This is my dynamic. I, I don't know what your dynamic is. What has that got to do with law, you will ask me? What has that got to do with pro rigor system or access to justice? Nine years after, there has been no stoning. It may have something to do with access to justice or rule of law. But this is my dynamic. I understood it. I work within it to get justice within the same dynamic. I use Sharia to argue Sharia, and in q and I'm happy to discuss how we use Sharia to argue Sharia. By the time I was living, they, we had a long conversation, but this two things they told me which was most empowering than any other thing. And today I'm able to stand here, I want to give all the glory to the mullahs, not to me because they are more gracious. They said to me, we will not publicly accept or, you know, accept what you're doing or applaud what you're doing. 
but we also not publicly oppose you. Now, it's important that I'm not opposed because then I couldn't have continued with other cases. By the time I left Nigeria to come to Harvard, I have handled over 150 cases. And I'm still handling some cases. Now, the point is that what is your dynamic? Is humility part of your dynamic? What is, how does a system work to slow down the process that we are together? So, I will finally say that irrespective of who we are, what we do, irrespective of our privileges, irrespective of the color of our skin, there is something much more powerful even as we mourn the death in Paris, even as we struggle each day to come to terms with inhumanity against human, and as we address our topic of today, the poor legal system, there is much more. And for me, the much more is the power in each of us the power in each of us sitting here. The dignity of each person and the worth of a human person that we carry with us. The humanity, the common shared humanity we have is more powerful. I believe there's a powerful force that unites us together and will keep uniting us together. Thank you. thank the speakers. Um, it, that was just such a beautiful summation of, I think, knowledge, humility, and strategy. And I think there's nothing better to start a conversation at a law school. So I've been handed some questions. I'm very conscious that we have a short period of time. There are quite a few people who'd like to hear more about Amina Lawal's case. I wonder if you would like to take her case a little bit further in terms of details and maybe Connect it to some of the challenges perhaps you see today. Um, one of the questions specifically was, in the age of Boko Haram, are there limits to the kind of advocacy you can do in the Sharia courts, for example? But sort of even just entering back into a little bit about that case would be very, very welcome. I didn't want to bore you with details. <laughs> and I would love to see people that I'm speaking to, so I will stand up a little bit. Um, in the age of Boko Haram, can we do advocacy differently? So right now I'm working, I'm working on the issue of Boko Haram, okay? And my, my thesis is that one of the solutions of extremism, especially within the Muslim youth, will rest in the womb of the mother, will rest in the hands and the strategy of her mother. The grandmother, the wives, and I'll give you an example. So I was asked to go to Nigeria in 2004, June, to be part of this effort to get the uh, kidnapped girls. And as you know, the United States gave us some drones. China gave us some drones. France also did. Of course, Israel did. And we had really st strategists that came all over the world to come and help us. So we had different levels of meeting. And we met with the president of my country, President Goodluck, the immediate past president. We met with all the service chiefs. So just think about the service chief in the United States. We met with them in my country, OK? So we met with everybody that matches, from the federal to the state. And then. We had a conversation. I was like asking, but there's something that is missing. They said, what is missing, Hawa? And I said, there's one very interesting group that I think need to be, no, I didn't see them, I didn't hear from them. Now, in Islam, 
actually it's a Quranic verse, and I don't want to quote it. I mean, I don't want to get it wrong. Somebody could Google it and find out. There is no cohesion in religion. Nobody will force you to change your religion. That is a Quranic verse. But most importantly, there is a hadith that gives respect to the mother. The holy prophet was accosting, and he was asked by somebody, who will I my loyalty be? Four times, the mother, the mother, the mother. The fifth time is the father. So there is still that culture, partly culture, partly religion, born between a son and his mother. It's even more stronger between the male children and the mothers than the girl, child, and her mother in my culture. So because I was in my own space, which is uh, Meiduguri in the Northeast, I was like, where are the mothers? We didn't hear from them. And they said, are you cook one day? We have drones, you know? So I insisted, and I said to the chairman, can we please hear from the mothers? And he said, if you want to do it, it's your problem. It's not ours. So this was last year. And I went out with some good intelligence around, and we went to visit some of the mothers. Some of their children were in the prisons in Meiduguri. And now, we spoke with them and they were like, we have not seen our children for so long. And we said, can we see them together? So we ended up with the mothers in the prisons. For the first time ever before this okay, meeting. The mothers see their children, saw their sons after so long. They didn't know what was happening. So those of them that are still there in the prison. And everybody broke down. So the mother broke down. The son broke down. And then the mother will ask, what happened? Maya Faru. Maya Izafi. In Hausa. Is what, what has become so hot? What has become, what has turned into this? And then everybody started talking. Some of the intelligence that I think today they are using was partly what we gathered because the mothers were in prison to visit with their sons and they were able to open up. They couldn't get the information from no interrogation, no torture could have given that. And I call the mothers a soft power. And this is my own situation, my society. And I'm sure you do have something much, much similar, even much more robust. So for me, one way to look at the way forward is how do we include women on the table? We can include them at, the, at that level of mother to child. We can include them as a level of wife, husband. We can include them at the level of having them on a round table, even at security meetings we should bring them to the table because there is room for them on the table. I'm not sure we can fight ideology with force and succeed. I was trying to get the word today, if I pronounce it wrongly, you have to forgive me because it's part of my English trying training. And I will ask you to help me. It's meta, metastasize. So when you want to slow them down, they metastasize. That is what we have seen over there. So I think one of the way of looking at how do we fight Boko Haram especially is to see how we can get it from the root. We go to the root and unplug it. I was speaking with Mr. Robin earlier and he was saying, I was asking him, what is the future? What do you think about the future of the law? He said to me, oh, the future from a, from a legal perspective, he said to me, the law is in the hand of women. And I said to you, using his word, if we have women actively involved in the global initiative, in a quiet way, in a, some of us, some of our society, we don't like the press. And may I say that we do not use another man's eyes to sleep. Did you get that? You do not use another man's or woman's eyes to sleep. And that the oxygen of terror is publicity. So cut out the oxygen if you can. And don't use any other person's eyes to sleep. Allow them from within 
to get a solution. Um, uh, I mean, my own uh, uh, comment on um, uh, extremist groups and uh, uh, would be that uh, we should also never forget the socioeconomic dynamic, you know, that uh, a lot of what is fueling uh, um, these issues is the, the hopelessness with which the youth found themselves. Uh, in a lot of uh, places, Nigeria included, I mean, you're talking of 80% of the youth unemployed, you know, and just really without any future. I think we have to create conditions for them to believe that there's something for them in this life and in this world and in this country. And I think that's one of the major challenges that, uh, so that uh, I completely endorse, you know, uh, the approach that uh, uh, she's taken, you know, in terms of uh, women getting involved in peace initiatives, and I think we've learned a great deal. I worked in uh, peacekeeping missions, and I think that we've come a long way, you know, and we've seen the positive influence of actually involving women in, um, in these processes. But I think that going forward, we must also tackle this hopelessness that is in these countries. You know. Great. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. So th <coughs> this question is about the difference between a strategy for a specific case and a strategy for change more broadly. So, you know, you talked about using Sharia itself to achieve a, a win or to achieve a strategy within a case. Is there also then the need to look beyond Sharia in, in a strategy for social change? And just as a, as a question, might that include human rights law, for example, or human rights norms? Or are they similar dynamics and, and is there more of a continuity there. Okay, yeah. I think that, uh, I mean, the experience um, uh, in terms of uh, these high impact cases in a lot of uh, jurisdictions, uh, I'm familiar, I don't know if they're familiar with the work being done by a group in South Africa called SAUGA, uh, Southern African, I think, litigation center or something like that. And what they've been doing, I mean, even in the Bay case, they're the ones, what they try to do is to take high impact cases which uh, would result in a reform of the legal uh, system. Uh, and I think that's a, a useful strategy. And uh, you can see it, it's worked in Botswana in terms of uh, the women's groups. And uh, uh, very recently in, um, in Namibia, the same organization targeted, for example, the question of uh, uh, the sterilization of women who had AIDS uh, by hospitals. And uh, again, very high impact, and it has led to uh, general improvement and legislation in the context of the entire uh, region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I see a role in terms of um, uh, these sort of uh, uh, issues, yeah, yeah. And I think somehow we have to develop uh, strategies which make people on the, these processes, you know, uh, so that they feel that uh, they are part of it and it's them. They can see, even in the law, when they look in the law, they can see, yeah, he's talking to me, you know, and I think that's really very critical. Uh, and how, how do we do that? It's a, I think, a very uh, important uh, point, yeah. Um, so let me suggest three things as how we can go about, I mean, there are many, many, many ways and it's going to depend on, it's contextual. So let me start by saying it's contextual. Um, and I'll just give an example of how we have used for social change or what is happening. I'm working on it, so I'm boring you today with my work. And I hope that we can talk after so that you can give me much more uh, thought into it. So number one is contextual. So try to see what is your context and how do you approach it within your context, okay? Um, so recently, I've been working on this issue of uh, the extremism, and I'm writing a paper on um, freedom and security, the issue of our time, and how do we curb youth extremism. So this is my current project. Um, and so I have gone on the field. Remember, I am a villager, so I can blend in very easily in wherever I am. I was, I was, I was in a, a man and I could go to the villages 
outside a man in Zachary in Irbit, for those of you who know the places, and I can easily blend and understand their language. So it has helped in a lot of ways. So I'm doing this research, and I'm also, I had, I had worked I had worked with some people in Nigeria and still working. And so a couple of things I just want to drop as a strategy we have used and we are using uh, with the youth. Um, number one, we are trying to see how can we help, and you're absolutely right, Dr. Professor Muna, the hopelessness in the society, you can only imagine. You can only imagine. The economic hardship, you can just imagine. So. So we are not going there because we cannot provide. But let me tell you what we can do as mothers, as sisters, as friends, as peer pressure group, positive peer pressure group. We decided to do something differently, and that's what I'm going to end up, and I hope you will shut me down in a second. Um, so we did decide to work with the youth and integrate what we are doing with them. So raise a group of mothers in different villages and different communities and different societies and this is what we look out for. Now the moment a young man that has been brought up in his family started changing we noticed, we, we tried to get people to notice and let us have a place where we can share information. Uh, some of these things we try to look for which we have been discussing now is open. If he has his trousers for those of you that can see me, if he has his trousers just below his knee, something is happening. If normally he had his trousers normally, and he started wearing his trousers a little bit above, you know, just below the knee, not a good sign. If he start keeping beers, and he never did before, watch out. If he start talking and say, Wallahi tallahi, in Allah's name, Allah, hmm, watch the language. If he didn't have an X6 iPhone, and you start seeing him with an X6 iPhone, be careful. Now, watch where he goes to pray and who are his, what one he speak, who are his uh, heroes. So these are the small, tiny little bit, I won't go into the other details that we have now tried as mothers to collate, but more as peer pressure group. So we have sort of worked with some few youths and decide in some societies to make them our own agent of making it happen, change. So it's happening at different level in different society under different contexts. Uh, we are doing that similar in, in the Netherlands with some friends of ours. Um, so mothers are coming in um, young other adults are coming in to help with this process. So this is, could be one way, but like I said, every, every other society, every other context we work with, there may be something we can do. But I beg you, if that is my last plea and my prayer, let us not demonize. Let us not judge. I ask, we ask the question, that the Boko Haram we met. Why, uh, what do you want? What do you want? Why do you kill? You're saying, that, what do you want? You know what they said? And they said it proudly. We are doing the work of Allah. They, they mean it. They are doing the work. But I don't know which Allah, which God will ask you to go and kill your fellow human being. But this is a different discussion. Or oh, what do you want? We want to die. So there are some people that are cut out to want to die. We are all potential victims of them. But if we understand it a bit, bit more comprehensively, the world would be a better place because of each of us sitting in this room. Thank you.